Is your screen frozen, Dennis? Mm, I don't think so. Oh, it's, it's just because cool. we're logging on. Yeah, I'm logging on. We should be live on Facebook now. Can everybody hear me? Somebody say yes in the chat. They're saying yes. Thanks, Devin. All right, cool. Share my screen here. All right, this should be a lot of fun. All right, for those that are completely new to the autonomy application, uh, please ask as many questions uh, that you have. This is for you. For those that already signed up for autonomy, you can get a one-on-one. -on -one, so please don't spoil it for everyone else. Um, just at a time on my calendar. All right. Uh, and so when providing home and community health care, uh, it's um, you want to be able to communicate with those that are around you as well as be able to communicate the needs of the consumer or client um, in a moment's notice. Unfortunately, um, and probably still happening today, uh, most of the documentation is commu and communication is done through separate systems or offline, meaning uh, it's done through paper, meaning uh, a staff member does their shift and documents it on paper, uh, it's delivered uh, to the actual office of the agency where someone reviews it maybe once a week to do payroll and billing. For, unfortunately, that's still being done today in many agencies around the US. Uh, and so when I started my agency, I really needed to figure out um, a way to go paperless. Um, so let me just go back in here, sorry about that. I really needed to figure out a way to go paperless. Um, and so one of the first things I did was I went paperless. Uh, I used a system where I was able to create forms and then customize them on the fly, all right? And so when you register in autonomy, you have your own business or you can create your team. Uh, for those that are starting, I create it for you. Uh, but once you have your team, it kind of looks like this, right? So it's your, this is your settings, right? And in your settings, you can invite people to your team or your business. Uh, and those team members could um, be staff members that have access to certain channels, right? Um, a channel is a place where um, people can communicate, kind of like a, a chat room or um, in your iPhone, when you start a, uh, a text message and add somebody to that text message, it's a shared text message or a shared group. Uh, so this is something like that. The only difference is you can create these different um, topics and channels based on whatever you want. Um, so it's really taking over a lot of small businesses um, because this is a better way to communicate. Um, so Fortune 500 companies actually use this type of communication means. I took it to the next level where you're able to um, have forms in the channels. Um, um, again, I want it to go paperless. And so these are some of the forms that are in your channels. Um, and these forms are related to the actual regulations on how your agency is governed. A lot of the CEOs that are going through licensing right now, we're reviewing the policies and procedures. The policies and procedures are actually built into the autonomy application so that staff are um, can provide services and able to uh, know how services are to be provided. So they actually sign off on some of these um, documents um, directly through the autonomy application. Uh, as well as the consumers. The consumers, um, we want to be able to document everything. Uh, and so um, if there are any updates, uh, if there are any, um, any type of um, prescriptions or 
um, any type of changes related to the actual consumer, we want to uh, um, document um, everything. Um, and so uh, this is an example. Let me give you an example. Not well, sure I'm pulling up the example too, and just want to give you guys some language. So, a consumer is, um, you know, a patient or a client. But for, you know, in this type of setting, in a community-based home healthcare agency, we tend to call them consumers because we see them, you know, just like everyone else. They're really trying to get to that end goal of living independently. So, um, consumer is normally the normal language that we utilize for what, you know, whatever what we call like patients or clients. Yeah. Uh, and some states call them participants if they actually participate in a waiver. Um, but I, we, I stick to consumers. I believe CMS also uses consumers, right? All right. Uh, and so uh, as far as going paperless, um, I built this uh, form creator to not only go paperless, eliminate any type of paper that staff need to fill out, but also a way that I can quickly review documentation, have proof, meaning I could have the um, staff member uh, sign off on something um, at a specific location. Uh, but most importantly, because each consumer is different, I want to be able to um, ask the staff member certain questions to answer on um, while providing services. And if there's a behavioral specialist or some type of other third party involved, I want to also give them the opportunity to, to update or change forms to their liking um, because they're, they are just important to the overall service delivery. So this form reader allows us to go paperless and uh, have other people involved in the overall service offering. So that's an actual test form right there. All right. Uh, and so uh, let me sh um, let's create a channel and, and check out this test form. So an actual test form, again, uh, actual channel, the channel is just like a group text. Um, but each group or each channel could have different topics. Um, so we could just call this topic, um, uh, I don't know, I was going to say quarantine. <laughs> um, Today's live. All right, so uh, I, I can actually make this channel completely public, meaning anybody in the entire autonomy application can access it, no matter their location. All right, other messaging platforms are not HIPAA compliant, meaning anybody could access it, no matter where they are, if they're invited to the channel or not. I took it a step further and made it HIPAA compliant because we want to have people to access these channels only if they are allowed to. Um, if you allow anyone to access a specific channel at any time or location, that opens up um, service delivery to fraud. People will document um, and say that they're at an actual location when they're not actually there. Um, that that was an instance that happens a lot. And then you're billing for services and, and that's potentially fraud. Yeah, didn't uh, you have a, um, a DSP like that, Dennis? And you used yes. the software to track him down that he wasn't there? Uh, yes, well, initially, uh, they, when we first started, um, we were documenting with paper. And then I realized that people were lying. Um, I got a call from the support coordinator and said they said that the staff member wasn't there. Uh, and so um, this this actual staff came with the consumer. So the referral came the where the consumer came with the staff. So I trusted that they were fine um, since they were the person was receiving services that um, there was no potential fraud there because the provider before me was billing. Uh, and so uh, down the line, I, I found out that that um, staff member was um, forging documentation, um, even with supervision and oversight from a support coordinator, a supervisor. Uh, and so what I needed to do was I had to um, 
the first one of the first features were, were um, electronic visit verification. And that allows us to see the actual location of each update, each form that's completed, each update inside of the actual channel, we have the GPS location. So there's no lying about anything. Um, and we want complete transparency because uh, we don't wanna really um, spend too much time on, on reacting to what's going on. We wanna take a more proactive approach to service delivery so we could focus on care and care for more people. Um, and so the goal of autonomy is to have a proactive approach uh, and have transparency so that families could be involved, support coordinators and can be involved. All the people who have the most questions, their answers could be right there in front of them. Um, that, that limits the number of questions you'll get through the phone, through email, um, everything that comes down the line. Trust me. All right. Uh, so as far as uh, the different types of channels that are available, we have public. We have public um, based on your specific region, meaning if you're in a specific region, say a couple of counties wide, you're, um, you can share an actual channel with people within that vicinity. Uh, invite only. Uh, that's just people who are invited into the channel. Uh, HIPAA compliant requires an actual location address, meaning the person that you invite into the channel can only have access if they're at that specific address. And we're actually adding the next step um, that should be released pretty soon with the sensors as people start providing services where you can only access um, specific channels based on location inside the home. So that's with the sensors. We do have uh, a, um, a YouTube video that shows that actual demo that was done in 2015, so five years ago, All right? Yeah, so just recapping what Dennis says, it has HIPAA compliance, it has GPS tracking, and then what Dennis is saying, I know a lot of you guys know this, but for those that are new, so there are sensors in these homes that Dennis and the autonomy team created, and it's basically registers when a person and the DSP or your staff is in a room. So if, if Jim needs his medication at nine o'clock and it's in the kitchen, then it should register when they're in there with the sensor at nine o'clock that they're in the kitchen with that sensor through the autonomy platform. So that's what Dennis is talking about with the sensors. Right, right, right. Right, uh, and so the sensors, let me show you, they're most important with training, all right? When you train, when you train and do an on-site orientation, when you have a staff that does on-site orientation, you wanna make sure that they're completing those trainings um, as guided. So you have smoking safety procedures, staff chore responsibilities, special protocols, locations of um, medications, fire evacuation procedures, daily routines, uh, documentation procedures, sleeping procedures. You have all these things that are specific to that consumer in their home. Um, and so with our sensors, we're able to document and verify that the person um, reviewed the fire evacuation procedure and um, actually uh, completed the task of ev evacuating the home according to the fire evacuation procedure, all right? Very important. Um, with this type of documentation down the line, if there is any question about um, the, the actual staff knowing how to evacuate in case of a, a fire, we have proof that they were trained and they signed off and they actually um, we have, they actually completed the task of trying to evacuate in case of a fire. So it eliminates any questions down the line, right? Let's go to a consumer file. So there's an example of an actual consumer file, all right? Um, again, this is a channel and the channel, you'll have all the staff in here where only specific staff can access this channel if they're on their shift. You can invite family members where only family members could view specific information in this channel. You could have um, 
support coordinators, uh, third parties such as behavioral specialists or um, therapists in this channel that could ask questions or receive updates um, with HIPAA compliance where they can only access certain information when and where needed, all right? All right. So this is an example of an actual electronic visit verification form. Um, again, these are completely customizable um, based on the person's needs. Uh, and so one of the requirements of electronic visit verification is pretty simple. Um, it's just indicating the service type. Uh, it also requires the actual billing code. Um, so that's an easy pull down menu. I've done that plenty of times uh, where the actual staff member selects the service in the, in the uh, billing code. Um, they'll know from their, from the start of their shift, which, um, service that they're providing. And then uh, based on the consumer, they can choose the activity um, to work on during that time. And then they could uh, prompt the consumer based on how they were trained. Uh, and then they indicate the type of prompt that was used, hand over hand, direct verbal, indirect verbal, uh, whatever was necessary. Uh, then they also can um, indicate the reaction, how many times it took them to respond, things like that. All right, um, and most of the time, that is it for this type of electronic visit verification form. And it's completed, it could be completed every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, every hour. And it, it gives the entire team an update of what's going on. A lot of the times, um, we're, we're able to track different moods, um, different types of things related to the actual consumer. Um, all of this information is automatically filled in because we're able to use information related to when they actually access the channel and when they left the channel to create a timesheet where the timesheet is used to actually uh, bill uh, and uh, pay the actual pay the staff. Right? And uh, most encounters for those that are more independent, they must sign their signature. Um, so at times we've uh, also put time limits on the time frame when this form is actually opened uh, to the time the staff signs to the time the consumer signs, because there's been instances where a staff member would sign and probably would come back to the home and have the consumer sign maybe a half hour, or hour later. Trust me, uh, it's been done before. So there's actually a time limit on um, when this is actually filled out to the time the consumer actually signs, and that's tracked in the background. That's really smart. Yeah. And I know a lot of you guys, when I, I've talked about this, of how we want to be proactive and with autonomy that Dennis created, um, that note right there, it should take about a minute. So while we are super proactive, we want them to document at least one time every hour, you can see how it's pretty simple to do that quickly within um, you know, a minute to uh, two minutes at most. And um, oh, it looks like we have a question from Marla Dennis. What type of device is this completed in? Um, I'm guessing like, are you saying how to access autonomy is, is your question? And, and what would you say in response to that, Dennis? Sure. Um so that we originally uh, launched in the iOS and Android app stores. This version is a web version because a lot of people uh, did not have enough space on their phones. So with a web version is very light. It does not save a lot of information on your phone and you can access it from any browser. Um, so all you need is a smart device. It could be a iPhone, Android, um, iPad, um, it could be a desktop computer, but as far as staff providing services, it needs to be a mobile device because of the sensors. Yeah, I also think that's really smart, too, that it's not stored in the phone because I, just even for HIPAA compliance, but also most phones, they don't store a lot. I mean, I'm always having issues with that with my phone. So um, right. Sharon has a question. Will the support coordinator have access to a channel to track, follow a consumer? Of course. Uh, initially, uh, I had problems with support coordinators because they were still using paper. Um, and so each time they would have a question, I would just keep telling them, hey, look, it's all here. You know, the entire history. We have an audit trail of everything. Um, 
any question you have, you can just look inside the application. So now people are starting to come around. Um, but five years ago, um, it was really hard uh, having them uh, log in to see all the re information readily available. Uh, we can we can we can go as high as up as uh, the state regulators, the auditors. Um, that's the that's my goal to provide that transparency all the way up to the actual payers, so they can see what's going on. Because if they're able to see what's going on and search for for um, whatever question they may have, um, we know that we're providing services based on regulations. So that's less questions that we'll have down the line. But you've also had auditors uh, utilize autonomy or, or review from autonomy. So even though you haven't had payers yet, what was your response from the auditors that reviewed autonomy's um, data? Right. Uh, so in 2015 was the first, um, the first audit where they used autonomy to, to review documentation. At that time, we were probably around 50 staff. Um, so they, they, they came in. Uh, most of the time, they look for paper versions. So since that was my first audit, I had a, all the files of all the staff printed out as well as access to the app. Um, and so if they, if they felt as though that they wanted to just look through the employee files, I just had them available. But eventually they just said, you know, we're fine just searching through the autonomy applications. Um, so at that point, I was pretty happy with moving forward and um, really didn't really care what other people thought at that point because the auditors were fine. Um, and so until this day, um, I'm always fine with, uh, I don't care what other people say, if the auditors and the payers uh, like the application and they, they like their ability to quickly search for what they need, that's what we want. We want them to be in and out. Um, so autonomy allows them to do that. And hopefully soon they don't need to come to your site. They could just review from remote. Yeah. So you felt that they were quick when they utilized your, the autonomy application. Yes. You can, yeah, you can ask any provider. They do not want, you do not want a, a auditor to stick around long. Mm -hmm. um, the longer they stay, the longer they look for things. Um, so give them access to find which day or which staff that they want to look for trainings or um, any anything associated with build services. And then at that point, they, they could find what they want from there. Okay. Let me just follow up with Marla's questions. I'll let you then talk about incident. And then we have two more sure. questions after that. But Marla said, so no device or tablet. Um, you know, you, you can clarify this one, Dennis, but you can use other devices as well. It's just the, the cell phone is the easiest one for the, the your staff to use, but talk about the other devices that they can use as well with autonomy. Anything, uh, anything with a with a web browser um, and, and internet. Um, so tablets, smartphones, anything that's connected to the internet, um, because with the sensors, the way the sensors work, the device that has Bluetooth. Um, it communicates with the sensor. Um, well, it doesn't actually communicate. It finds the signal that the sensor is pushing out. So the sensor uh, pushes out a signal maybe every five, 10 seconds. And from that signal, the phone says, okay, um, I know this signal that's right here. It is two feet away. Um, it'll, then the phone will send a signal to the app uh, and to our server and say, okay, this person is in the living room or uh, something along those lines. So the actual data at the sensor is, is dummy data. It's not really real HIPAA compliant information. Everything is in the server. Um, and all, the only thing that's communicated at that point is just uh, location data um, and anything else related to uh, actual service delivery it's again it's only populated when you're at the actual location um and you're only you only have access to forums when you're at a specific location um, um rena brought up i think rena brought up a good question because actually when i was talking to sharon she kind of brought this up too um with with her family um what happens if the client signature expires because um they forget to let the client sign or what if the consumer's like I don't, I don't feel like signing right now. 
they just are resisting signing that note for for the day uh so um that that happened before uh we can have an audio option if the person does not if it's known that the person is d denies signing um but usually they do want to sign or at least their family member if they do live with their family member they could sign on their behalf um but it, what was your first question as far as what expires? happens if it expires um trying to get the client signature to it oh to they have to start over they have to, they have to start the form over because we don't want them to be able to extend that time if, if yeah. the person does not does not sign they it must be in their presence they must they must be filling it out in their presence so if they if they are unable to um that means they're not in their presence yeah i mean that makes sense and it like it, it only takes a minute to redo it so it shouldn't be that yeah it doesn't it doesn't take long at all yeah okay you want to jump back in uh sure um so as far as um staff um documenting what's needed um while providing services this is one of the main forms that are, that's needed when um when staff are providing services to those with behavioral needs uh, it's really important that they fill out um, incident information so that a certified investigator could go out and provide um, their investigation and their report as needed. Uh, and so staff are trained in um, incident management uh, as well as how to document in case of an incident. So those that are going through licensing right now uh, there is a policy and procedure called incident management. So this is the actual form that staff fill out um, related to uh, the management of those of those incidents, so that that certified investigator could do their job as needed. And so uh, it's really detailed. But the most important part um, is really the the part related to restraint. Um, those with behavioral needs. Um, there's really a thin line as far as how you could um, support them with their behaviors. They could have outbursts or or, or um, start to destroy things uh, in the home or um, participate in some type of self harm. Uh, so it's really important to be able to support them in the manner as outlined in the ISP or behavioral support plan. Uh, and so. Um, and in one of the policies and procedures, you have a crisis policy where it's stated that, you know, you must follow the ISP and behavioral support plan. And if the staff does anything outside of that, um, the shift uh, and the burden shifts off of your agency. Um, and it's all based on this document right here, how the staff uh, documents um, the actual incident, because it will show how they're trained as well as how um, they uh, resolve the incident. Um, so based on this information and following information by a certified investigator, they'll be able to, to, to determine if the incident was actually abuse, neglect, or something along those lines. Right. Um, we're, getting, we're getting a lot of questions, Dennis, so let me try and get another one thrown out to you. So this is from Abby. Um, in Pennsylvania. So I'm assuming those are the documentation forms that get submitted to insurance for billing. So not the, the incident we were just looking at, but the other ones. Do we, the CEO, sign off on each of these documentation forms? No. You don't sign off on the electronic data. You could, as part of reviewing, there is, I'll show you. Uh, We add a, uh, another option here where you can actually like check it, check that it was viewed, but there is no requirement as far as regulations that you have to show that you reviewed the actual documentation. By billing, that's showing that you reviewed the documentation. You don't want to bill without knowing what's in your documentation because you're going to eventually get audited. That's what the audit is for. Okay. And then Donna says, who provides the devices to the staff? I guess she may be talking about just the autonomy application, which is just on anyone's phone. They can just download 
the application data, but maybe like the beacon sensor she's also talking about as well. So who provides the beacon sensors in the homes? Autonomy provides the beacon sensors. Uh, as far as uh, devices for staff, uh, we take the approach of a bring your own device similar to Uber or any other um, uh, on-demand service right now. Uh, smartphone is your job these days. Uh, you know, you, you must you must have a working phone. Um, anybody that is still in 2020 that says that they don't have a smartphone is lying. Um, so, um, and everybody knows how to use Facebook. And so this type of application, I, I, I initially mimicked it after an application that most people know how to use, Twitter or Facebook. Um, so most people know how to easily use an application like this. Um, and they do have a smart device. Everybody's on Instagram. Everyone's throwing a lot of good questions, so keep them coming. Um, we have another one from Heather. I think this is Heather from Ohio that's getting started with us. How is it you know your staff is on the way to a consumer? Do you have an app or a location service for on the DSP phone? So, you know, we talked about this before, but could you explain a little bit differently about the DSP going to the consumer's home or maybe they don't go to the consumer's home? What happens um, in like the, your back office the, through the autonomy application, Dennis? Right, and in the next couple of weeks, you'll definitely, we'll start to share more updates in the coming weeks. Um, so the next week we'll start to share the updates related to the training, all right? And then um, probably the week after that, we'll start to show you the updates related to how you can see where staff are as they're on their way. Uh, but that's what the dashboard is for. You'll be able to see all the members within your team as they're providing services. Uh, so you'll you'll eventually see that as an update in autonomy. So I'll be glad to share that once it's available. Well, let's say like the DSP doesn't show up. Like how does autonomy, what's like the autonomy, you know, in the back end doing through that? Sure, I mean, sure. have you had that experience, Dennis? Did some of your DSPs not show up? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm in an actual test account right now. Uh, so, yeah, we won't be able to. All right, so I'll be able to access it from here. So there are tons of channels. There are tons of channels. Uh, you could um, search for the DSP123 channels, as you can see here, uh, where you'll be able to see which staff have completed which training, right? Sp specific to a spe specific to a training topic or overall, all right? And that's where you'll be able to see the pool of staff within within your team. The, the, the pool of staff within your team are the ones that you already have interviewed. So there's a pool for your specific team and there's a pool for your region, right? Uh, and so you'll be, you'll be able to view the, the pool within your team where autonomy pulls from your pool of team, your, your team pool to find the next person that's available. And that's based on the policy in your, um, in your backup. Uh, policy and your policies and procedures. Yeah, so if your DSP, you know, is not moving, it's static, and they're supposed to be there by nine o'clock, it's going to register the autonomy, your pool. So remember, if you have an agency, you know, and you have other agencies around you, you guys can use this shared pool of staff, you know, you just have to interview them. And if you like, autonomy does all the training, remember that. So they, you, they get up to the point where they're in front of you, you do the interview, if you like them, then they're in your pool. So it activates the pool if a DSP just doesn't randomly show up. Um, right, that's, that's done in the back end. It's not an actual, like, you're not gonna see it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's done in the back end. Yeah, but it saves you a lot of time and stress, less stress. Yes. Uh, we're able to do that because we're continuously checking locations. Um, so as you're in the application, so what I was just showing you, the map automatically adjusts to your GPS location, everybody. Um, uh, and so we know your location uh, by just um, logging into the application. It's HIPAA compliant, I can't see it. 
Um, but that data is used to determine where you are, how far you are from the next location. Yeah, so Heather, to answer your question, it's from the GPS um, that's in the autonomy channel. Okay, Lenny has a question. In a situation where staff loses internet access, uh, does provide a service, but unable to obtain signature, what would be the recourse? Right, uh, and that has definitely happened before. Uh, we have ways where if they do sign in, we're able to screenshot, uh, where you, you're able to upload that screenshot at a later date to the actual form. So if you saw one of the forms, we do have the option to upload, to just show um, that it was signed, but you couldn't upload it. So that definitely did happen. Uh, as we re-released the Android and iOS version, that does allow for data to be saved in the actual application um, that is encrypted, um, where the data is then pushed back out to the server once uh, access is made to it to the internet or Wi-Fi signal. So those are the two options that we currently have. Um, Donna asks, is there a cell phone policy? There is a cell phone policy as far as usage. While, let's see if that was. I believe there, yes, there is a cell phone policy as far as usage while in the home. Um, but again, uh, we need the staff to have their device what to document. Uh, so it's very limited uh, and we can't really um, tell them not to uh, have their device open, uh, but they should respect the actual consumer when providing services. So it's, it's all about their overall, um, how they feel about the job, uh, how they'll act uh, in the workplace. For example, Uber driver, um, you would give them zero stars if they're on their phone all the time uh, while driving, talking really loud. So it's kind of like in this instance, we'll be able to, you, by going out on site, you'll be able to, you know, really um, see what's going on um, in person more often uh, and get that feedback from the consumer um, sooner rather than later. Uh, so if they feel as though that the person is on their phone too much, you could really um, just, t just swap out that staff person. Uh, there's really no need to have a disciplinary action and you just move on to the, to the next person. Um, so the, the staff really don't want to go down that line because you're giving them a great opportunity um, working with you uh, in that environment. But maybe the other cool thing too is like not just about like the disciplinary action. Um, I know we're just talking about cell phone policy, but like for DSPs that are doing an awesome job, like you know what what have you done with your experience for good DSPs? Like what feedback and how did you give that feedback through autonomy? Right, uh, and so one of the things I, I did was I did gift cards. I did additional training opportunities to earn more. Um, so most people, and so that's what I did with the DSP one, two, three, if they actually show that they could do more, they get the opportunity to opportunity to do more, um, and earn more. Um, so that's what really motivates them the most, um, getting more opportunities to earn more and not just be stagnant. Um, cause it's a tough job and, um, they, they want to move up, um, if, if they have the chance. Uh, so it's more just um, giving them the chance to um, get more opportunities to earn more by helping out. Agree. I just did an interview with Kyle, who's literally the first moving forward, um, meaning like he's at the stage of getting referrals. His agency has been approved. You know, Dennis and him and we're working hard and he's now at that last stage. And he put it really beautifully, too, is, yeah, like gift cards or, you know, ways to, in, you know, increase them more to to do more but just feedback you know just giving them feedback like on a weekly basis is such a great thing because a lot of these dsps don't get feedback so to have us as the ceos be able to you know mentor them and guide them during this process where you can do it remotely through the autonomy application but also when you go on site you can give that to them as well and that's something really that isn't there and that's a really great thing that you get to empower for your staff. So that's a really great feature that I was really excited about when I first, you know, started with autonomy. Cool, cool. 
uh, yes, uh, when I, when designing the DFP one, two, three is definitely, um, a need to continuously motivate the staff. Uh, and so the overall trainings in the DFP one, two, three, which next week I'm going to have, uh, Dr. Niche, um, on, uh, so you can ask questions related to training, online training. Um, uh, I built in his learning management system into autonomy because not only do the consumers have customized needs, but the actual staff have customized needs um, when training them to understand how to support the consumer. Uh, and so uh, this DSP 123, these training modules help an actual staff member learn how to provide healthcare as well as be able to move up to, to earn a living wage. And so in the current environment, it's hard to have a, have a staff member and allow them to not only set their own schedule, but to earn skills that could um, land them a job earning a living wage. Um, and so I had to really study the industry and what these what's required to really manage services in order to put together this type of training program. As people train the DFP one, two, three, they're able to really manage an entire home for 24 hour care, um, which is really crucial to help more people age in place outside of an uh, institution or hospital. Um, so with more people able to really provide these services with the proper um, tools in their hand, um, more people would be able to age in place. So that's really the most important part here. It's really hard to do um, without this, these types of tools. And I, again, I really appreciate this because, you know, I've, you know, as a, I've been with autonomy and I'm an advisor with autonomy, I've seen different elements of home care and I, and I've got to witness traditional home health care. And I saw what, the problem areas are like I've heard many conversations with Dennis talking to traditional home health care agencies and the top two things they will say is they do not have staff. Um, there's a huge turnover crisis that they're always trying to fix and they don't have a great training program that works online, but also um, on site. So like this program that they train, they're going to do some online, but they're actually going to do shadowing on site. So it's a very cool approach. and. It's funny because most traditional home health care and you've been there, Dennis, will say, oh, my gosh, like you have an Uber pool. Like, can I have it? Or like, can I have a learning learning management system? Like, that's great. But what they do, and this is why you didn't move forward with traditional, is that they take it, but then they still underpay staff. And that was the whole reason that Dennis created this was to give everyone livable wages. So he did give it to previous home, traditional home health care agencies. But they just took it and they didn't change the wages of staff. So, I mean, that's why you, you didn't move forward with with traditional right. home health agencies. Right. 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 And I always invite anybody to, you know, cold call them and say, hey, you know, I have a I have a tool that could help you eliminate your staff turnover. I can recruit, train and maintain a pool of staff for you. They would say, where do I sign up? I guarantee it. Mm -hmm. Where do I sign up? I have 50, 100 people that I need. Um, so it's this is exclusive to your agency because um, what, we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to be as efficient as possible in the back office. I mean, efficient as possible. If I could automate everything, I would. Um, because the, the, the actual consumer is suffering right now. They're unable to really, they have so many unmet needs. Uh, and it starts with the actual agency um, and to actually prove that you could provide that transparency and train staff um, that know what they're doing um, so that this person can age in place. And if you, you're able to do that, that, that's when referrals start to just flow in. You, you're going to get three to five referrals per week. You'll be denying people because they need better care. Um, so this this is the infrastructure that helps you do that. Um, and most states, they have not seen such a solution. Um, and so unfortunately, they still believe that, uh, you know, it's not possible. Such transparency and coordination is not possible. Such ongoing training is not possible. 
um, because it has been going on for so long. Um, I've met people that have been in this industry for 30 plus years at meetings and they don't care anymore because they don't believe that it could be anything could be done better um, because they really don't don't know from a technology perspective that these types of tools were used in other industries. And um, as a result, businesses have, have been very successful. Melinda, I'll get to your question next. I just wanted to like chime in as well. Like, so I had to do a live class in Pennsylvania and even the people that were training me were so burnt out. Like I remember sitting there with a bunch of other people wanting to start a home healthcare agency and they were like, listen, if you're here just for companionship care to move your agency forward, I will tell you that you're going to have issues. You know, we're so sick of, of what these services are come to be, you know, essentially what they were uh, were upset about was the value care there was no value care it was just seeing multiple clients you know providing staff that are usually underpaid and continuing this vicious cycle and a lot of these people are unfortunately burned out so i'm excited to be a part of this like refreshing movement where we're actually providing value care and we're changing, you know, to be a transparent type of agency that really focuses on the client and not just about numbers. So, yeah, it's all all good stuff because of you, Dennis. So, um, um, I like to hear. <laughs> Melinda has a question. I have heard Shana say in other videos that we need to review documentation daily for roughly 50 minutes. Um, do we just look over every DSP's notes daily? So. I always talk about this a lot, Dennis, you know, you can get your back office done in 15 minutes a day on the days that you're not on site. So could you talk them through what that 15 minutes will look like for the days where they're not on site? They're just, you know, doing that back office review. Sure. sure. So you actually um, get an email every day. Um, every day I had it set at 7, 7 p.m. So uh, every day you'll get an email summary of all the forms that were completed, all the shifts that started and ended when they ended. So you'll be able to quickly see at a glance and then uh, go into each channel to double check everything. Um, so you have two options there. You can just review the email or go into the actual application uh, to see what's going on. Um, and so I created quick notes to, um, get updates uh, as far as they're kind of like electronic visit verification forms but they're more much shorter it's just this top part um, where we're able to see every 15 minutes what the mood is of the consumer and things like that um, so as far as uh, billing um, the only thing that's required for billing is the encounter form at the end of the shift um, with electronic visit verification, you now know when the, where the person is at the start of the shift and at the end of the shift. Uh, and so we we match that in the back office. So all you're required to do is just review that and counter form at the end of the end of the shift. Um, and you're able to do that through your mobile device. Um, and an encounter form looks something like this. So nice. And that's all that's needed to build. For the entire shift, it could be three, four hours. Um, I like to have these based on the actual activity. So there's an encounter form based on each activity. So you could probably see three of these um, per day for one consumer. Is the activity is, so this is a random question for you, Dennis, Yumly, which you integrated with Autonomy. So Yumly is, um, it's like a recipe, like, I don't even know how many recipes are on it, but it helps to break down into like, if you have diabetes, or if you have like restrictions like salt, or, you know, different types of foods, you can have like a thousand different recipes, like at the touch of your hand. Would that be in that section, the choose activity, or would that be in somewhere else? Mm -hmm. uh, the actual activity would be prepare or present food options to consumer where you're able to, at the time, switch over to Yumly or uh, hopefully we're able to integrate it um, pretty soon 
where you could actually show the options to them directly in the application. Very cool. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I can show everybody Yumly. Yeah, I thought Yumly was really a cool thing that was integrated with it that you have, because you, you know, healthy eating and cooking, that is a major non-medical service that you can provide if it's if it's in the client, if it's in the consumer's individual support plan. So you can work yeah. on many different recipes. They can choose it. You know, you guys, you can scale it, you know, very simple to, you know, a harder level. So this is Yumly right here that Dennis is pulling up. Oh, it's going to extra slow. Okay. So this is what you guys will have access to to utilize and your staff will have access to utilize. Yeah. And I liked it most because you could choose different recipes um, related to the likes of the consumer. And then if you don't have the ingredients, you can get them delivered to you. Um, so in certain areas, uh, you know, during snowstorms, we needed, we wanted to make sure there were certain foods uh, at certain homes. Uh, just to maybe boost the spirit or have a Friday night special for, for a consumer. Uh, and so we would use Yumly, present to them different meal options, and then order. Have, it, have the ingredients delivered to the home. Now it's an activity that they can prepare together with the DFP, uh, and then eventually eat it. So it's a pretty good option there. Yeah, this got me, I, as an OT, this got me like super excited. I was like, look at the options. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, like, so just going back on the sensors, Dennis, you said you were going to do a Facebook Live with Dr. Niche. Is that a... Um, yes, next week. Next week. Okay, so this, if you guys want to get more information on the sensors, please chime in next week. We'll give you another webinar link for this, and you'll get to have a Q&A session with Dr. Niche. Um, he does yeah, have a video. Yeah, we, I mean, I can post a YouTube video that there is with him and, and Dr. Nish with autonomy, so I can give you that prior. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, so um, IntelliDapt is a online learning management system, and um, they actually took it a couple notches up, which still, I don't even think it's really mainstream yet. Um, but they use a, let me see, a brain, they call, it's an EEG headset. Um, I actually have a picture of, of it on. Uh, I'll try to share it. Uh, let me see. Uh, but it's a, it actually tracks your brain waves while you're um, completing training. And then it will change the content based on your mood. Um, so if you're in a terrible mood, it's going to probably present a game or something like that without you actually completing anything manually. Um, and so it, it helps a lot of people in, in that capacity. Um, so EEGs for brainwave, um, brainwave detection to help people train better is becoming more mainstream. Um, so I, I discussed that with Dr. Nish, how we could be applied, but um, I, I actually had some consumers that something like this was recommended to them by a therapist. Very cool. Yeah. Really cool. Uh, so let me see. If I know you had a picture of here. No, I'm just not. Uh, yeah. So next week we'll talk about his learning management system, how we built it into um, autonomy um, to really um, take it to the next level, help people learn how to train um, and provide uh, better healthcare services. Because with most of the trainings out here, most people just learn and they, they forget about it, um, what they've learned. And it's really important um, for people to, to really understand what they're learning um, in a healthcare um, environment. Agreed. Um, another question, Morgan, uh, who's one of our CEOs, says, how does the process work if someone has a referral for the DSP pool? 
we put them into contact with someone at autonomy and then we can interview later. So this is someone where it's like, oh, they would be a great person to have in my DSP pool. How would that look? Um, you know, if they didn't go through the training yet, but like that was like the next step. Sure. Uh, and so autonomy is free to the general public. So you would you would just um, invite them to register in the autonomy application. Uh, so that they can go through the DSP one two three training, right? Um, and that's it. Uh, that's that's how easy it is uh, for anyone to start learning how to provide better care. Uh, and as they progress with IntelliDapt on the back end, we we have so much data about how they're they're completing these trainings. We have how fast that they're completing these trainings. Uh, how long that they're taking, how many questions they got wrong, um, um, are they just clicking the same one, same answers for each one to just see which ones are right and wrong. Uh, and so with this type of data, we're really able to assess the potential staff member um, and share that information with you as well to make a better decision before hire or before they start providing that service. Um, so it's a standard across the board, no matter which state you're in. Um, everyone goes through the same training process. It could be more training based on state regulations, but we, we put this standard in place to really assess them before hire to save you time and money. Yeah. Um, okay, you, there's one thing that I think is really cool. Again, my OT mind, I really love this. Um, that you didn't get to talk about yet, and it's just with the map. So this right here, so as your agency progresses, as you get to really know your community, um, this is the long-term goal is to utilize this map and have an open communication with restaurants in the area, with YMCA, the library. So do you want to talk about that a little bit more, Dennis, So, you know, what that really means in, in that communication through the autonomy platform? Sure, that's Thank you, that's very important. <laughs> I don't know how I forgot that. Uh, the reason why this is a dashboard first or a map first application is because, again, for you, I want you to be able to see where your staff are at all times. Um, and as well as the staff, I want them to be able to provide a better service to the consumer. And in order to provide a better service to the consumers, to be able to offer services outside of the home. Everyone does not stay in the home when receiving services. Most of the time they're out in the community um, trying, to, trying to participate in activities of daily living. And so with this map of your local area um, allows the staff member to do, it allows them to um, have a customized view of the places that they can go based on the ISP or behavioral support plan. Because you could very well have a consumer that has behavioral issues that maybe wants to go to Chick-fil-A and maybe at 3 p.m. when a lot of kids are getting out of school, they're not supposed to be around kids, right? The staff member is not gonna remember all that. So you need to be proactive and be able to allow them to still participate in activities, um, but still keeping in mind the health and safety of, um, of their of their overall um, service delivery. Um, it uh, um, eliminates any potential incident that could happen down the line. Right? Um, and so something like this did happen did happen in my agency where an actual staff was tricked. Uh, consumers are very smart. Um, even though they're, they could very well be on the spectrum, they know what's, what they can do and cannot do. So we have to be proactive about um, guiding, um, guiding staff and allowing them to complete tasks throughout the day. Right? Well, you can't just um, say that and tell the story. Huh? Um, yeah, so uh, actual staff member was providing services and the consumer wanted to go to um, a museum. And at the time, they were going to an actual museum and the actual staff member allowed them to. <laughs> uh, and so 
um, because he said, hey, what do you want to do? Um, I know this is in your behavioral support plan. I was trained on this, um, but we could go here. And so when we did find out through documentation, we did contact them to redirect them, but then we had to remove that staff person because that was a potential incident. Mm. Yeah, um, that was in the behavioral support plan. So we were able to catch it with the software, but at the time, something this advanced was not in place. Mm. Um, so again, everything that I learned, um, we're creating a better solution. So as far as being able to communicate ahead of time, uh, such as going to a library or going to a store, those with behavioral needs can't really stand in lines or um, maybe they have an outburst if they stand in lines. So we wanna be able to communicate with these businesses uh, to allow them to just let them know that, okay, we're coming. And if we can get some type of accommodation to um, eliminate any type of possibility of an incident, um, they should be able to offer that type of service. So autonomy, we're, we're building in that solution so we can communicate directly with a channel. So there will be a channel in place with each business. Um, so each business can communicate with you. Um, you could communicate um, specific needs if needed with HIPAA compliance. Very cool. Um, I know it's getting to be 10 o'clock. I know you guys, you know, we're on Eastern time. Um, so we, we definitely want to answer all your questions. It looks like we just have one more from Lisa. If any of you, of you guys want to ask more of your questions right now, now is the time. Um, Dennis, did you want to talk about our secret? I don't know if it's a secret because I'm like literally saying it out loud, but um, you know what we're doing during the, the COVID-19 crisis and, and what we were going to do with autonomy in terms of those that were interested with getting started with an app, um, an agency? I don't remember what we decided on yet. <laughs> we, we, we've talked about different things, but uh, as far as getting started, I, if you have time, this is the best time to do it. Um, you know, you could get started or complete whatever required training um, before you, before outside opens back up again. Uh, so other than that, I we did discuss things, but I don't think we finalized it yet. Um, I sent you the coupon through Canva. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, everybody. I didn't look at it yet. <laughs> I'll check it out tonight. To, um, to be discussed tomorrow, everyone. Surprise away. <laughs> yeah, to, yeah, to be discussed. Um, yeah, another thing that I'm working on, um, it's kind of like a contact tracing to help, you know, um, there's more and more contacts in coming out right now. And I believe Apple and Google just talked about a contact tracing to help people track those that do have COVID. Um, and help those that talking about that today. Yeah, I've been talking about it for a while now. So it's, it's, it's something that um, autonomy is already able to, to do. Um, we're already tracking your GPS. Like I said before, if you're in the application, you're opting in and we're able to um, have your information uh, or secure your information with HIPAA compliance, meaning nobody else sees it. A lot of these other, other applications that are coming out right now, that data will be sold, um, unfortunately. Your data will be sold uh, to the highest bidder. Uh, with autonomy, I'm looking to um, create some type of contact tracing solution so that those with healthcare needs could really age in place and know what's going on around them. Because again, the goal is to um, be outside, uh, be outside and inside, participate in your community uh, with activities. Um, so we wanna know who's, who's around us, um, how to, if to social distance if needed, um, and so we, we already have the infrastructure in place with a map first application. Yeah. Which is needed because they're already talking about it could resurrect in the fall. So let's have this already in place while, you know, agencies are getting up and running. Um, Jim said a lot of good information. I'm going to talk about Lisa's question. 
Um, but in the interim, as I'm asking Lisa's question, could you guys just give them, give us some feedback? Was this helpful, especially the CEOs that are going through right now? Was this helpful for you guys? Do you guys want another webinar um, in general about another part of the autonomy application or just autonomy in itself? Anyone that is new to our group, could you let us know what else you'd like for us to focus on? Um, I definitely would say if you haven't registered with Autonomy, I'll give you the link for that because it will give you a lot of information like a business plan and how it will look in your state. So if you want th something more state related, please um, click on the link that I'll provide for you guys if, you're, if you haven't registered yet. But just let us know what else we can do to make it helpful for you guys because that's our goal is just to make it helpful, more transparent and, you know, especially our CEOs getting you more in your role as a CEO. So Lisa's question is, so um, an interested DSP candidate completes the DSP 123 program as part of the application process before hire. Is that correct, Dennis? They complete the DSP 123 program before hire. And how long does it take on average to complete the hiring process? I've had people that completed in 24 hours. Uh, it all depends on if they are already experienced, if they already completed trainings, again, the turnover in this industry is about 75% or more. So a lot of the people that will be going through the DFP 123 will already um, be working in the industry. So that helps them speed through the process. It's just verifying a lot of their information and, um, and, and completing anything um, specific to your agency. Uh, but other than that, it could take, um, I've seen 24 hours, um, based on your state, it could take a week or two. And it all depends on um, their experience and your state. I would say your, their experience in the state, because some states require a little bit more training. Mm -hmm. um, but Pennsylvania, I've seen it done in about a, uh, a day or two. Very cool. Lenny said, I would like to know more about the billing side of things. Sure. Um, so as far as billing, um, I'm not going to show you the actual billing side, but I can show you what's done on the front end uh, and how we take that information to bill. I can do that. All right. All right. So it, it's, it's as simple as. what I just did, <laughs> really, you know why. Um, when a person goes into an actual channel, it's a timesheet, that timesheet is created, all right? Um, so the timesheet is created when they go in there, and then when they leave, the timesheet is the end of the timesheet. And so uh, one of the things that we did was, um, with that timesheet, we added a signature option. So when you actually click that lock button that you just saw, it's a, um, we have the signature now with a uh, clock in and clock out, and that's a timesheet. Uh, and uh, with that information that's in the consumer's file, you now have documentation related to encounters, uh, as well as the timesheet. So all that information is compiled, and that's what we use to build. Uh, when you actually go out on site one hour per week for a consumer with behavioral needs, you review this consumer file while on site. You can ask questions, um, document whatever updates, and then we use that to bill. And if I'm um, saying this correctly, let me know um, if I'm if I'm not saying this correctly. With the note that you showed us with the DSPs, you know, up at the top it said home and community, and then the one below it said supportive employment. So if they click supportive yeah. employment, that's going to bill differently, correct? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So what they click, what service that they click at the top, and you know, this, you know, the different types of services will be put up there, those non-medical services, but that will direct what the billing is for. So supportive employment is a is a billing is a service that in Pennsylvania is normally double the standard of a typical non-medical service rate. It's normally sixty-eight dollars 
um, an hour versus typical home and community uh, inclusion is around $36 an hour. So it will, you know, once you click that type of service you're providing, then it will start to process that and send that over to billing based off of how many hours or time they spent with the consumer. Exactly. Okay. Hopefully um, that answers this question. Say it again. Hopefully that answered this question. Well, it answered my question too. I was thinking that too, but I was like, is it that simple? Um, it is. <laughs> uh, I made it. I made it extremely simple. I can show you how it's done manual or how it's done through other agencies. It's nothing like this. The timesheet is totally separate. The documentation is totally separate. So when uh, it's time for billing or payroll, somebody is checking the timesheet. Um, somebody is check checking the documentation, make sure it's aligned, um, and then they have to figure out if they've gone over. Um, the time that was that can actually be billed. Uh, that's how a lot of um, overbilling occurs, uh, and and that's how they actually lose a lot of money um, because they have to pay the staff uh, for that time. So this this allows us to make sure that if you're clocked in, you're providing services. If you're not if you're not clocked in, you you're not providing services because we know that they're at that exact location. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of therapists, you know, want to focus on the billing side a lot because we're thinking of a lot of a CBT code. So realize, you know, what Dennis is showing you tonight is the non-medical services of the DSPs. So, you know, it's not like what you have to oh, think right. about. Yeah. Right. I know right. for the yeah. like, it's crazy where it's like, oh, I can't bill two of Therax and one of Therax or therapeutic activities. Like, it's not that type of craziness. You know, these are Medicaid. It's not. Universe. These right. Th this is this is the actual billing service. So it's, it's really that easy. The code could be W seven zero two one, and this one could be W seven zero two two, and that's it. There's nothing more, nothing less. We just have to make sure the documentation is there, um, the staff are trained, uh, so that um, in case of an audit, this documentation will be checked um, for this for the staff member the entire time. Um, so we need to make sure that everything is in order. But as far as billing, um, this is it. This is it. We take it from here and we bill. Um, Jim said, going over what policies we need to look over. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing maybe talking about, you know, when it's time to, you know, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, like, policies and procedures, things that come up annually, like checking the fire detectors in the home or things like that. Um, autonomy is the one that prompts you or you need to look at a certain section within autonomy, I guess, go over that. Uh, sure, so within your team, we're, we're gonna assign a bunch of forms. As you can see here, there are about a hundred forms right here. Uh, and these are related to the actual services that um, you're providing so there are policies and procedures in here there are additional trainings in here as you can see the on-site orientations are here and then we assign them to specific staff that need to complete them at certain times um, uh, if you need to complete certain things at certain times we'll assign them to specific channels and then add uh, prompts to them uh, where you have to complete them at specific times or locations. Um, and that's how we make sure and that you're in compliance um, at all times. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, Melinda, who I believe is getting started in Tennessee, wants to know how much training is provided from autonomy for new CEOs once their agency is approved. Okay. Uh, I try to... <clears throat> I try to uh do as much before um it's approved um we're i'm getting i'm getting more time to train train everybody to on the actual application now and hence this one um but you'll definitely have time to understand the application and how services are provided provided through the ramp up period where you get one consumer at a time. Remember, this is long-term services, so that one consumer 
will probably be the first five months after you're authorized for services. Uh, and so you'll definitely have time to see each consumer as they as they build into your agency because they'll be there for years to come. Um, so you'll definitely have time um, to learn um, not not just the the service side of thing, but uh, the policies and procedures uh, as staff um, follow them when providing services. Um, but but before authorized, you should be you should ask me whatever questions before you start. Um, that's why I did the audio version for you. So you could just listen to it, um, make it a lot easier for you to ask me questions related to the actual policy and procedure. Um, yeah, but I guess also too, maybe her question is, you know, what if she comes across, she has a question about a consumer, you know, you know, what, you know, wants to reach out to someone through autonomy about, you know, a certain consumer or, um, you know, handling a certain issue, things like that. Uh, yeah, so that question. Yes. Yeah, so, um, Melinda's question may also be like just like on the site questions that she gets, maybe not just the autonomy application, but like she has a consumer and, you know, something happens to the consumer um, or maybe like someone has an incident like and they want to like have someone else to help them through that experience. So how would that look with autonomy? Sure, and, and this is all outlined in the policies and procedures. Uh, as far as how to go about an uh, incident, it's outlined in your policies and procedures. Um, you should definitely review that um, to, to really understand uh, how autonomy manages the incident, how it's communicated, how a peer review team comes together. Um, I definitely um, talk about that on the audio as well as um, indicated in the policies in the in the actual policy. As far as um, anything related to the consumer and their ISP, um, you're able to you're able to ask questions, um, ask the support coordinator questions. You're able to ask other people on the team um, if they if the consumer has behaviors. You can ask the behavioral specialist. Uh, the behavioral specialist puts together actual behavioral support plan and how to approach them uh, if they do have behavioral episodes. Uh, so you, you do have plenty of people to call on um, and you have documentation to prove um, other, uh, anything that you're asking. Um, so that's the key here, having documentation uh, to, to ask proper questions and to back you up. Okay, and I think this may be our last question for the night from Lenny. Um, and I and I I totally understand where he's coming from because I feel like therapists when they have their own business, um, I've seen this in other like Facebook groups like Med B services. Sometimes their service gets denied um, or you know they they don't accept that certain type of billing. So even though you built it, even though you did that service. So what if there are payment issues from insurance companies? How was that handled in this system? All right. uh, these are pre-authorized services. So you, are, you actually are authorized for the entire year. Um, and so for example, you'll know how many hours you have for the year. You'll probably see 2000 hours for the year for community have services, um, a thousand hours. And I feel like you're like, um, you sound like your voice went up like three notches. All right. Oh, that's better. There we go. There we go. <laughs> right. Well, um, you'll have, these services are pre-authorized. So when you receive the referral, the services are authorized for the entire year. Uh, and so there, you really won't get denied for the service unless you try to bill more hours than are allowed for that week. Most states allow about 50 hours per week that can be billed. So if you try to bill over that, of course it's gonna get denied. But if you bill within what's pre-authorized, you'll always get an approval. And we're proactively monitoring that as well. Yeah, that's a really good point that it's pre-authorized. And I know because a lot of therapists, you know, when they're billing themselves get that stress sometimes of, 
well, this, you know, will I get reimbursement for this? So you, because it's through the Medicaid waivers, you know, these are pre-authorized. So like Dennis said, if you're over, if you're doing more hours than the ISP states, that's when you'll have an issue, but you shouldn't run into an issue. Right. And since we manage, we help you manage the staff, um, we, we schedule them. Uh, we know ahead of time how much hours that they're actually providing per week. So it's very rare that we'll run into that. Very cool. Well, I think those are all the questions. We had a great, we had like 27, 30 people on for the most part through the live and through this group. So it was really awesome to get to have this open conversation. Dennis, this makes me feel, you know, there's some new features I didn't even realize that makes me get excited for in the next upcoming months for me doing my rollout with this that I'm looking forward to more. And yeah, I didn't realize how much the timesheets were so simple. So that's really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you guys have any more questions, you can reach out to us. I'll send you how to register if you didn't get your home health care agency in a box yet. Um, you know, if you want Dennis's calendar, you know, I always give that out. Set up a time if you want to chat with him or with me. Um, you know, we're an open book. We will set time up for you guys if you want to have more conversations, if this is something that's interesting you. I hope this was a good night. I think you did a great job, Dennis. You got some good feedback. And yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.